Hey guys, I found another COVID-19 alternative hypothesis on the internet, and this time it's on something I've never really heard of before. I know, I know, you're probably all tired of hearing about the coronavirus at this point, so am I to be honest. We'll slow it down in the upcoming weeks. Anyway, there's this video posted on Instagram or something, and then a flat earther reposted it to his channel, which is how I found it. While we debunk this, we'll also be learning some biology and how some of the testing works. Okay, let's get right to it. Here's a new theory. First, consider that we live in a world where everything is toxic. The soil, the water, the air, our food, even our medicines are toxic. Even stress can be toxic. Depends on how you define toxic. If you give it a very broad definition, then yes, technically everything is toxic. Now imagine that all these toxins are poisonous to us on a cellular level. Imagine that our cells have a defense and respond to the situation. Poisoned genetic material, either RNA or DNA, is packaged up and sent out of the cell in tiny balls of protein. Let's call these balls of genetic material exosomes. Okay, first of all, are you defining that these toxins are RNA or DNA? I get why you have to spread that narrative because viruses operate on genetic material, but you can't say that these two are toxic. RNA and DNA are strands of nucleotides which on their own wouldn't be able to do anything. You need proteins and cellular machinery in order for them to become influential in any way. Viruses come with such proteins, and the host cell provides this machinery. This point is going to be important for later on in the video. Second of all, exosomes are packages sent out of the cell, and they're mostly used for cellular communication. They mostly contain proteins since their formation buzz out from the endoplasmic reticulum, but can contain many other metabolites and RNA. Now that being said, exosomes can indeed contain toxins such as various proteins and even MIR. RNA, for example, anything that disrupts regular cell function and has detrimental effects are considered a toxin here. Bacteria releases them all the time in the form of exosomes, when they are attacking human cells for example. But to package up RNA or DNA obtained from the environment? Eh, not a thing. Let's imagine that exosomes can act as messages to alert other cells of a particular poison, and so all throughout the body, more and more cells package up the poisoned material and release it. Also, at certain times of the year due to temperature cycles, humans tend to purge a high number of these poisons and genetic materials out of the body, resulting in symptoms of illness. Why would purging this genetic material out of the body cause symptoms of illness? That makes absolutely no sense. If you're purging any toxin out of the body, that should have the opposite effect. These exosomes neither cause illness nor are they infectious, though they do appear to spread throughout the body. Exosomes are always found in your body. Take a blood sample and you'll find exosomes in it. It's a very important communication tool for long distance cellular signaling, so of course they're common. miRNAs, for example, are found released by almost all types of cells. In case you don't know what miRNA does, they're a type of small RNA that participates in gene silencing functions in epigenetics. It's funny because I read a paper about two weeks ago about using exosomes as a way to deliver drugs to specific cancer cells. This technology may give certain drugs that normally aren't specific to tumors the power of discrimination. Anyway, that's a little off topic. The point is, exosomes are important communication tools, but they can work both ways. Pathogens can utilize them to cause infections. Normally, this would give your claim a tiny bit of authenticity, perhaps, if it weren't for the fact that you're trying to replace viruses with exosomes entirely. Now, that's exosome theory. Let's move on to the established theory of viruses. Viruses are generally regarded as not alive. They have no cellular structure and do not reproduce on their own though we do have trillions of them inside our bodies. Yes, indeed. There are trillions of viruses in our body, but most of them are non-infectious to humans. They're sort of there, chilling, and infecting the bacteria that live within your body, of course. They are tiny bits of genetic material, either RNA or DNA, packaged in tiny protein balls that appear to exit and enter cells. Sound familiar? If you're trying to compare viruses and exosomes, they're very similar. In fact, they're almost the same, so I can see why conspiracy theorists like to say that viruses are just exosomes. This would make your previous statement somewhat valid when you talked about how exosomes containing RNA or DNA would cause a positive feedback loop of exosome release. But there are multiple key differences. The contents are different between the two, and their effects are different. Viruses kill their host cell during its lytic phase, for example, while exosomes deliver multiple different signaling molecules such as miRNA and are not infectious. In addition, the sizes may be different as well as their capabilities. Ultimately, the contents to determine what it is, but they are indeed similar enough to suggest they had some sort of relationship in evolutionary history, perhaps involving one copying the other. Is it valid to say that viruses are just exosomes carrying variants? Sort of. I don't see why not, but I doubt that's what these guys are going for. We believe that some of these entities are infectious and pathogenic, 
transmitting amongst humans and reproducing inside our bodies, causing illness and death. So let's look at the situation for this coronavirus and compare what is happening to these two theories. Definitely a virus. Let's first consider the origin story of the coronavirus. A group of people had a respiratory illness unresolved by antibiotics, so medical officials began looking, of course, for a virus. Doctors don't diagnose a viral infection by giving the patient antibiotics and seeing if they work. No, patients infected with COVID-19 usually have a fever, and a fever is a good indication of a virus. What they eventually found under the electron microscope were small protein balls being excreted by the cell. Okay, first comparison. This would make sense in both exosome theory and virus theory. I don't know where you got the idea that they looked at infected cells under a microscope. I honestly don't see what the point of that is since they would already know it's a virus. The problem is, which virus is it? When you diagnose a patient, you can look for specific genes and DNA sequences and match it up in a database of known viruses. When that returns no results, it's possible that a new virus has emerged, and that was the case here. Then they searched for and found an RNA fragment that they had not seen before in some of these patients. This would make sense in both exosome theory and virus theory. It just so happened that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a retrovirus, aka RNA virus. Your theory wouldn't make sense for any virus that uses DNA. This is because exosomes mostly contain RNA, but they almost never contain DNA except for some cases of cancer, where the tumor cell would package double-stranded DNA into exosomes. Basically, anyone who has been infected with the DNA virus and doesn't have cancer would disprove your hypothesis. Now they did not prove that they could infect somebody, or an animal, with a purified form of this so-called virus. They simply assumed that this RNA fragment was the cause of the illness they saw in some patients, and they assumed it was contagious. You're wrong. It was actually assumed that SARS-CoV-2 was not infectious at first by the WHO, but was later proven so. In the beginning, obviously scientists aren't going to purposely infect other people just to see if it were transferable, but you can tell through simple observations. A positive patient comes in with known contact with someone else who had it? What about the fact that this virus spreads around beginning at a starting point, and that the first cases in other countries besides China always had someone who had travel history from China? It's an established fact that this virus is contagious, which by the way wouldn't be the case if it were exosomes, so that's a point for team virus. So do you know how the tests work? It's not a binary test, like a pregnancy test. It's called a PCR test, and it involves amplifying genetic material by doubling it in dozens of cycles until you have billions or trillions of the original molecules, and then using those results to determine if you have enough of the identified RNA fragment to be considered positive. Here's the thing. At a certain point of amplification, every single person would test positive. They use an arbitrary cutoff point where they stop doubling the material. That cutoff point is different amongst different tests for COVID-19. Okay, so it seems you don't really have a proper understanding on how PCR tests work. First of all, I must point out that there are multiple types of different tests. One test that doesn't involve PCR, for example, is a simple test to see if you have the antibodies for COVID-19. If you have the antibodies and you're showing the symptoms, then you're probably positive. If you have the antibodies but you're not currently showing symptoms, you've probably had it before. Anyway, let's talk specifically about the PCR test. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction and is a very common procedure in biological research. Basically, you have two primers that flank the DNA position of interest and with the help of a polymerase, you can amplify the region over and over again until it's at an acceptable concentration. Depending on the experiment, you'll use this product for different purposes, but experiments involving DNA usually would need a large quantity of it, which is why PCR is so important. You can't really run an experiment when you have one or two strands of the DNA after all. Now, there are specific types of PCR, but the one used for COVID-19 diagnostics is called Quantitative Real-Time PCR, or QRT-PCR. This procedure takes the RNA, which of course at this point must have been extracted and purified, turns it into DNA, then amplifies it. This amplified DNA is tagged with a fluorescent marker, and the fluorescent activity is measured throughout the process in which the DNA is amplified. The amplification follows a certain pattern, and we know the speed in which amplification occurs. Basically, you do QRT-PCR until you reach a certain point, then you can take the fluorescent measurements and work backwards to determine the initial quantity by doing a little math. Now, what does this mean, and how does it debunk your point? Well, it means that the number of PCR cycles doesn't actually matter as long as it's within a certain reasonable range. As long as you've kept track of the number of cycles, you'll end up with the same result as as long as you do the math correctly. You seem to be under the assumption that the PCR just keeps doubling for however much time, and as long as the final concentration is above a certain point, the patient is deemed positive for COVID-19, but that's not the case. You have to do some math and find the initial concentration of that RNA. 
And perhaps you've heard about some of the problems with the test, such as the high rate of false positives. Yes, false positives is an issue with any test, but it seems to be exceptionally high for COVID-19. The reason is less to do with the biology of it, but more so the lack of regulation. Many, many private companies came up with their own tests, and they haven't been verified extensively to see if they worked. As a result, lots of them simply didn't, and they returned lots of false positive results. Also, when someone has had the virus before and recovered from it, they can still have many RNA fragments of SARS-CoV-2 within their blood, which contributes to false positives. In addition to all of that, the CDC initially didn't have nearly enough tests when the outbreak first came to the US because they didn't have enough reagents for the RNA extraction and purification step, which is just the most outrageous thing ever. So yeah, our tests aren't perfect, they are flawed in many ways, although the situation is getting better as we speak. But in any case, let's say that after 37 times of doubling a specific genetic material they found in your body, they determine that you have enough of the RNA they are looking for to be considered positive. This could make sense in both exosome theory and virus theory. According to your exosome theory, okay, fine. But clearly there are clusters of people getting ill. Look at New York City. It must be a virus. However, if you are being poisoned by something in your environment, it's likely people near you are too. And if we commonly purge these poisons during specific times of the year, many people may have symptoms of illness all at once. This fits either theory. No, because it's not just clusters of people getting it. We know it began from China and then started spreading to other places. Unless you have some sort of explanation on how this poison started in one area and migrated around to others, then perhaps your stupid exosome theory could get a point. Besides, if it were a poison, we'd be able to track it and find the source of it. I wonder why that hasn't been done. Here's where things get interesting. Let's go to the Diamond Princess cruise ship situation. Did you know that people who were bunked together for days had conflicting positive and negative tests? How could one person have this highly infectious illness but not transmit it to somebody bunking with them for days? This would make sense in exosome theory, where the balls of RNA are not contagious, but it would not make sense for virus theory, where the balls of RNA are supposed to be highly infectious. There are incubation periods of up to 20 days with an average of about 5. People also experience symptoms differently, with some being more mild than others. I couldn't find any source online talking about how some people got it while others didn't, when these people were bunking together, but the chances of that happening isn't even zero. This isn't conclusive evidence for anything. If you don't know the exact fine details of their cruise conditions, you can't be certain. In fact, do you know that there are many documented cases all around the world of patients testing positive for this RNA fragment with no relevant travel history and no known possible contact with somebody who was infected. There's absolutely no way you know that. Your claims are just being pulled out of thin air. Not to mention that you don't necessarily have to be in contact with someone who has had it to get it yourself. The virus can stay on surfaces for hours and days. What about the high levels of people testing positive who don't get sick? In fact, 80% of people testing positive are either asymptomatic or have slight cold symptoms. Why? And this would make sense in exosome theory, since the RNA fragments are not the cause of the illness. But it would not make sense for virus theory where this virus is supposed to cause the illness. You said it yourself that there are false positives. Also, these mention mild cases. The majority of people who contract COVID-19 will only have something similar to the common cold. This does not go against the idea of viruses whatsoever. Plus, I don't even see how something like this would support an exosome theory. So far, you've only laid out a vague concept of what it is, but haven't given any specifics like what these exosomes do exactly, how long it usually lasts, what sort of symptom patterns we expect, why it gives us cold-like symptoms, etc. So when you said, quote, makes sense with exosome theory, that doesn't mean anything to the audience at all except for some arbitrary idea that it somehow fits in with your definition of exosomes. Things get even stranger. Did you know that some people go from testing positive, to testing negative, to testing positive again in a matter of days? This actually made some scientists believe that you don't develop an immunity against COVID-19, but that has now been shown to be untrue. It turns out that people who have had COVID-19 may test positive again after recovering because of leftover RNA fragments or inactive virus particles. 
So which of these theories seems more likely to you? How about I present some actual facts that show why your exism hypothesis makes no sense. Now I'm going to ignore all the mumbo jumbo you presented in the beginning. You have an entirely wrong idea on what exosomes are and what cells use them for. But let's just give you all that. In that case, why don't we talk about the fact that a big part of the symptoms we feel are due to inflammation and immune response towards the virus. Unfortunately for you, exosomes released by our own cells do not trigger immune responses. So this is a point for team virus and no point for team exosome. What about the fact that we've mapped out the entire viral genetic information and found that it is over 95% similar to multiple other viruses. In your supposed exosome theory, that makes no sense. Another point for team virus. Okay, let's see. What about the fact that it can infect other species of animals? Scientists right now have already identified some good animal model candidates such as the Syrian hamster, which have been shown to experience similar symptoms when infected with COVID-19. Exosomes shouldn't be contagious, less so across species. Another point for team virus. Look, I could go on and on about this. It's time to drop the exosome hypothesis because it's unsubstantiated. SARS-CoV-2 is a virus.